Principal component analysis is a way of choosing basis vectors to represent signals by using the statistics or the correlation matrix of the signals. Recall that if we have a signal x and we're going to stack the samples of that signal into an n-dimensional vector denoted by the underscore, that we can represent that signal in terms of a basis expansion as a sum of basis vectors, psi k, times coefficients a k. So in principal component analysis, our goal is to find the best set of p less than n bases for a family of random data x. And when we say the best, we're going to use the criteria of the mean squared error. So we're going to say, in general, we need capital N basis vectors to completely represent x because it's an n-dimensional vector. But rather than using all n, we're going to use a subset, p of them, and we want to come up with the best approximation to x that can be done with p vectors, basis vectors psi k. Now we are going to collect these basis vectors psi k into a matrix, starting with the first column being psi 1 and the last column being psi p, and then we'll co collect the corresponding coefficients into a vector a with a1, a2, through ap, and we'll denote these as capital psi sub p and vector a sub p, where the p subscript is denoting the number of columns in psi and the number of entries in a, that we have a p-dimensional representation here. So if we look at the error that we get when we try to represent x using p basis vectors, it's going to be given by the minimum, the squared difference between x and our low rank or rank p approximation, where we choose ap in the best way possible. So the problem that PCA considers is to minimize the average value of this squared error over different choices of x. So we're going to take an expectation with respect to x, that's just averaging, of the squared error, and we're going to try to find the set of basis vectors in the matrix psi p that minimize this, but we're going to put a constraint on them that they satisfy psi p complex conjugate transpose psi p equals the identity matrix. Now because this is an n by p matrix here, psi p, we, and p is smaller than n, then we have psi p complex conjugate transpose is a short and wide matrix, whereas psi p is a tall and thin matrix, and the product of those two gives us a smaller square matrix, and that's going to be the identity. So what this condition is actually saying is that the individual basis vectors psi k are orthogonal, and they have unit length, or unit norm. So this condition can also be written as psi l h times psi k is equal to 0 when l is not equal to k, and 1 when l is equal to k. So this is the inner product of different basis vectors is equal to 0 or 1. Now because we have this orthogonality condition, and furthermore the bases are unit norm, you can show probably easily that the coefficients a p are just psi p h times the data x, and consequently our squared error can be written as the magnitude of x minus psi p, and this part here is a p, so we've substituted for a p, that magnitude squared. And if I carry out the magnitude squared, I end up with x h times the quantity i minus psi p psi p h quantity squared times x. Now when you square this matrix in the inside, it's actually a very interesting matrix. It's called an idempotent matrix, which basically means that when I raise it to a power, I get the original matrix. And you can verify that by doing the algebra yourself. So in the end, we have xh i minus psi p psi p h times x, and if I multiply through by x, I have xh x, which doesn't depend on psi p, minus xh psi p times psi p h x. So this is just the inner product of a vector here times a vector on this side. And consequently, my PCA problem, remember, was to minimize the average value of the squared error over x. Well, since I've rewritten the squared error in this form on the right here, we see that that's equivalent 
to maximizing the value of this term here, the inner product of these two vectors. And breaking this up into the columns of psi p, I can write this inner product as the sum k equals 1 to p x h psi k times psi k h x. And we want to maximize that by our choice of the basis vector psi k. So I can take the expectation inside, and this is equivalent to maximizing psi k h r psi k, summing over k from 1 to p, where r now is the covariance matrix or the correlation matrix of x. It's conventional to assume that x is zero mean, so hence correlation and covariance are the same here. And our constraint is on the psi k's that they satisfy psi l h psi k equals zero when l is not equal to k and one when l is equal to k. Well, you can show that the solution to this problem is to set psi k to be the eigenvector of r corresponding to the kth largest eigenvalue. So remember, the eigen relationship for matrix R satisfies R psi k is equal to lambda k psi k, where psi k is the eigenvector and lambda k is the eigenvalue. So the solution to the principal component problem is to take an eigen decomposition of the matrix R, look for the largest eigenvalues, and choose our bases as the eigenvectors associated with those eigenvalues. Now there are several properties associated with the principal component decomposition. First of all, if we look at the mean squared error on average, in other words, the squared error averaging over x, you can show that it's just the sum of the eigenvectors, I'm sorry, the sum of the eigenvalues that you did not include in the decomposition. So these are also known as the best bases for explaining the variance of x. We were looking at covariance matrix and consequently the best bases for explaining the variance of x are the eigenvectors associated with the largest eigenvalues. Furthermore, the individual principal components psi a, psi i times a i, remember x is equal to sum i equals 1 to p, psi i times a i, so these are individual components those components are uncorrelated. You can show that the expected value of ai complex conjugate times psi i complex conjugate transpose psi k a k is exactly equal to zero when i is not equal to k and it's equal to the expected value of the magnitude a k squared when i is equal to k. And this is a consequence of the fact that these guys inner product is zero when i is not equal to k and it's one when i is equal to k. And thirdly, these individual coefficients associated with the principal components, the a sub i, those are uncorrelated. So if I look at the average value of a i complex conjugate a k, it just becomes psi i complex conjugate transpose times r times psi k. And because r psi k is equal to lambda k psi k, I can substitute into this expression for rk lambda k, my eigen relationship, and consequently the orthogonality of psi i and psi k means that this is zero unless i is equal to k, in which case it is lambda k. So we have the best basis for explaining the variance of the signal x, and that minimizes the mean squared error which is the sum of the eigenvalues that we don't include in the principal component representation. All these components are uncorrelated and the coefficients are uncorrelated. There's another example that is particularly relevant here, and that is when we have a low rank signal in white noise. What I mean by that is our data X contains a signal of interest plus noise, and the noise here has covariance matrix sigma squared I. Again, we're assuming in general things are zero mean, and S is actually exactly expressed in terms of a sum of P basis vectors. For example, those could be sinusoids. So if I had two sinusoids, I can express that exactly in terms of four basis vectors if I don't know the amplitude and phase.
So anyway, P is less than capital N, which is the dimension of X. So if we look at estimating S as this low rank approximation, where I use principal component representation, psi P, P A P, then that just expresses S hat as psi P times psi P transpose times X. In this example, by the way, we're assuming the signals are real valued. So the complex conjugate transpose becomes the transpose. And I look at the error between S hat and S. Well, you can do the algebra and at the end of the day, you can express this in terms of psi P and N, which I've done down here. And that actually simplifies to the expected value of the inner product squared of psi sub i transpose times n. And if you look at the properties of n and evaluate this expectation, you find that this is just sigma squared i, well, sigma squared. And so I have the sum from i equals 1 to p of sigma squared. And consequently, my squared error between my estimated signal, signal and my true one is p times sigma squared. So it's proportional to both the noise variance and the number of bases that I need to represent my signal of interest. So signals with p very small are going to have less noise in them than larger p signals. Now if I compare this to the error between the original data and my signal, that just turns out to be the expected value of the magnitude of n squared, which you can show is capital N, the dimension of the problem, times sigma squared. So by doing this PCA decomposition and representing x in terms of a low rank approximation, I actually reduce the white noise by a factor of the dimension of the problem divided by the rank of my representation for s that is the number of bases that I need to describe S. Now it turns out that this is closely related to the eigenvalue shift property of these matrices. So if Rx, the covariance matrix of the data X, is equal to the covariance matrix of the data for S, plus this noise term, sigma squared I, whenever you add a multiple of the identity to a matrix, you end up shifting the eigenvalues. So the eigenvalues associated with x are just the eigenvalues associated with s plus sigma squared. So if most of these eigenvalues are zero, only the first p in my assumption up here, that s be a signal that can be described exactly in terms of p bases, then only the first p are non-zero. The rest of those are going to be exactly equal to sigma squared. And, of course, the largest eigenvalues are going to be associated with the sum of these two terms. So we should be able to pick out the components associated with the signal by looking at the eigenvectors associated with the largest eigencomponents. And so we're going to show that in an example here where I'm going to take sinusoids that have a fixed frequency but randomized amplitude and phase, and I'm going to embed those in white noise. So the amplitude of my sinusoid is random. It's going to have zero mean, and I'm going to choose the variance of that amplitude to be one. And then we'll choose the phase of our sinusoid to be a uniform distributed number between zero and two pi. And in this particular case, my noise variance is four. So the variance of the noise is four times as big as the variance of the amplitude of the sinusoid. And we're going to for purposes of estimating our covariance matrix R from the data, we're going to assume that we have 500 observations of our sinusoid plus noise. And we'll just form a covariance matrix as the average of the outer product of those 500. And in this particular case, I've chosen capital N to be equal to 128. So in the panel in the middle here, I'm showing two example waveforms that result from this random amplitude phase sinusoid in white noise and neither one of them looks very sinusoidal because the noise variance is so much greater than that of the signal. In fact, if we look at one example of the signal component, the true noise-free signal that's embedded actually in this first waveform here, 
you see that the amplitude of the signal goes from about minus 0.7 to 0.7, and it is a sinusoid of a certain frequency, but that totally gets lost in this noise, which has uh, quite a bit larger variance. So we're going to take our covariance matrix R that we estimated from the data and do an eigen decomposition. And what we see is that we end up with two large eigenvalues and the rest are smaller. So these two end up being associated with the signal term because we know that a sinusoid with unknown amplitude and phase can be written as the sum of a cosine at that frequency plus a sine at that frequency. So it has two components basically. So we're seeing two components here. And then we have the white noise term, which in this case, the variance of the white noise, recall, is sigma squared equals four. So most of these, all of these eigenvalues in the asymptotic case where I have an infinite number of vectors or I'm able to do the true expectation, all of those eigenvalues should be exactly equal to four. But we see here that we have some distribution of eigenvalues because of the fact that we're estimating this as an average and not using the exact covariance matrix. Nonetheless, they're kind of distributed around four. So if I pick out the eigenvectors associated with these two large eigenvalues, you can see that we're starting to be able to identify the sinusoid component, the frequency of it anyway, that's embedded in this data because we end up with a sinusoidal term for the first eigenvector, and the second one is the same term, but same frequency, but out of phase by 90 degrees, because any random amplitude and phase sinusoid can be described as a sum of two sinusoids of that frequency, a cosine and a sine term, or a two terms that are shifted in phase by 90 degrees. Now, if we look at our data projected, an example of the data projected onto these two pr principal eigenvalues, we get this signal estimate that I'm showing here. And the example that I chose, the particular random realization, is the one that was associated with this first panel up here showing the signal plus noise, and then this right panel on the top showing the noise-free signal. And you can see that we've done quite a nice job of reducing the noise that was in this original observation of x. In fact, since n is 128 and p in this case is 2, we should get a factor of 64 in terms of our signal-noise ratio improvement because that'll be 128 divided by 2 which is equal to 64. And that's kind of believable looking at this original waveform in which we could not even discover that there was a sinusoid in there, at least by eye. And here we can pretty clearly see that there is a sinusoidal component. It's still got some noise left, but nevertheless, we picked it out of the noise. Now, one of the challenges with the principal component analysis approach in practice is that in many problems, you don't have such a nice separation between the eigenvalues associated with the signal and those associated with the noise. And oftentimes the noise isn't exactly white as well. So choosing the appropriate value of P oftentimes is more difficult and requires uh, significant judgment in terms of deciding when do these larger eigenvalues cease to be significant or fall into the noise floor. And that's one of the practical challenges of applying this technique with more complex data.